I'm reminded of the little boy who was sitting on the park bench reading the Bible. And he happened to be reading the part in the Bible where the Israelites crossed the Red Sea. And so here come an older gentleman, and he sat down beside the boy, and he said, What are you doing, son? And the boy said, Well, I'm reading the Bible, and I'm reading about where God led the Israelites across the Red Sea. And the older gentleman said, Yeah, that, you know, sometimes that Bible's just full of a bunch of hogwash, and I really don't believe that. And everybody knows, anyways, that the Red Sea was only 10 inches deep when the Israelites crossed. Uh, so, peace out, dude. And so the man got up and he began to walk away. And the little boy celebrated in joy. And he said, it's a miracle. And the man turned around and said, what? And the little boy said, that God can drown an entire Egyptian army in 10 inches of water. <laughs> uh, Miss Allie's on the media today. Thank you, Michael Palzik on the sound. Molly on the camera. Thank you all for serving today. And we've got a one sin sermon for you today. And that's this right here. Be strong. Say, be strong. Be courageous, and don't take no lip. That's my favorite part. You don't have to be taking any lip today from the enemy. We're going straight to Daniel chapter 7, Miss Allie. If you'll find Daniel chapter 7, verse 11. Then I continue to watch because of the boastful words the little horn was, or the horn was speaking. I kept looking until the beast was slain. Say, Hallelujah. And its body was destroyed, hallelujah, and thrown into the blazing fire. Amen, brother. Because the enemy today is lying to you day in and day out. Boastfully in your face telling you bold-faced lies. No doubt about it. But in the end, he is going to get his reward, and that is hell and fire and damnation for eternity. I can't wait. I hope there's like a, a two-way mirror up in heaven and we can just watch. But today the enemy is lying to you. That's what he does best. Tries to intimidate you. That's what he does very well. Out of Joshua chapter 1, Miss Allie's going to take us to Joshua chapter 1. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, say after. I have interesting news for you today. You may not be aware of this, but if you are breathing today, you still have a lot of life to live. After the death of Moses, God turned to Joshua, and Joshua was shaking in his boots. Joshua could look around the Israelite camp and he began to realize, uh-oh, I'm the next senior officer. And as Joshua began to slip into the background and push Caleb up to the front and a couple other people, God said, you, Joshua, you, Joshua, my servant Moses is dead. <laughs> it's a pretty relevant scientific statement. And Joshua's like, I know he's dead. And God is saying, but you are going to lead and live for a lot longer. And I need you. The Bible says, get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land that I'm about to give them to the Israelites. God has something for you today. Get ready. The Bible says, I will give you every place where, you're, where you set your foot. Period. Well, it's a comma, but I'm saying period. Comma. As I promised Moses. How many of you know the only thing that stays the same in this life is constant change? That's it. Moses is dead. Now it's Joshua's turn to lead the people. But God has given Moses a pep talk. How many of you have ever had a pep talk from God? And you're like, hello, and you're, you're, you're wanting to put the brakes on. And God is saying, no, you, 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 this is your time and your place. I will give you every place where you set your foot, as I promised Moses. Your territory will extend from the desert of Lebanon, from the great river, the Euphrates, all the Hittite country, to the Mediterranean Sea and to the west. Next scripture. No one will be able to stand against you. Say no one. Okay. 
This goes for you too. This doesn't just apply to Joshua in case you're wondering. As I was with Moses. As you've seen God work in the past. And even as you have been jealous of seeing God work in other people's lives. Did I just say that? And you're like, well, God, you do for them, but you don't do for me. Just as God has done for every other one, he's going to do for you. He's not a respecter of person. He doesn't like you better than me or me better than you. And when you look around and you can see God moving, believe it for your own life. Be strong and courageous. It started with Andy Dixon preaching early this year. Then Coach Price Harris, our football coach at the high school, he decided he wanted Shazak V. Motts to be the spiritual theme of our football team. That is be strong and be courageous. Then Pastor Jen, a couple months ago, she gets up on a Sunday morning. She preaches about being strong and taking courage. Today you're getting Tom Golden's rendition of be strong and take courage. Because I see God doing something. We're talking about war cries here. We're talking about focus here. We're talking about vision here. Joshua, he doesn't want to lead the people. He doesn't know what to do. He doesn't know what to say. Moses has always had his hands in the miracles. It was never Joshua at the total lead. Joshua always had Moses. But now it's only Joshua. God says, Shazak v. Mats, be strong and be courageous. Be careful. This is big time. This is where I'm going to lose two-thirds of you, but you got the fight and stay with me. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from the left or to the right, that you may be successful wherever you go. Your success and my success, spiritually, physically, health, everything, it depends upon being devoted to God Almighty. It depends on getting in the Word of God tomorrow morning. Your success does not depend upon the praise and worship and the preaching on Sunday mornings. It depends on you getting in the trenches, learning the Word, reading the Word, seeking Jesus, praying to God Almighty. Be strong and courageous. Be careful. To keep my law on your lips, next scripture, Miss Allie. Keep this book of the law always on your lips. I've got a Bible in my phone. I've got a Bible on my laptop. I've got hard copies all over the sanctuary, in my office, at home, in my car. You've got to keep the word of God close to you. You don't have to memorize the whole thing. Today, all you've got to memorize is be strong and courageous. Be strong and courageous. Be strong and courageous. Be strong and courageous. When the enemy comes at you and you've got a challenge, a trial, or whatever you're facing, you're staring down the barrel of something, you don't think you're going to escape, then you've got to say, be strong and courageous. In the God's name, his son Jesus, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, I can be strong and courageous today. The Bible says, I have not come, have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. This is God's big speech to Joshua. Finally, the speech started to sink in and in verse 11 we can see joshua or verse 10 joshua he ordered his officers and the people he turned to the people and he said i'm bought in i'm going to be strong and courageous everybody get your apples in one basket tomorrow we're crossing the jordan river in your life Miss Allie, you can take us back to the one-sentence sermon, be strong, courageous, and don't take no lip. In your life today, I'm challenging you for the next seven days to be strong and courageous. Show some intestinal fortitude. So show some strength. Show some audacity in the name of Jesus. Get on your near knees before God Almighty. Pray out to Him. Believe. Say believe. We've got to believe. Be strong, courageous, and don't take no lip from the enemy. He's a liar. That's all he does is lie. There are a few people out there preaching the word. There are a few people out there living the word. But you still have to be strong and take And be courageous and don't take no lip. 
Joshua soon after. He comes up to the Jordan River and what's he do? He gets out the staff of Moses and he lifts it up and nothing happens. He begins to pray like Moses did and nothing happens. And then Joshua came into his own and God said, why don't you just take a step in to the river and see what I won't do. It's called a faith step. He steps in to the water. It's a step of faith. And what did God do? God split the waters right there in the Jordan River. And the Israelites walked across the ground on dry ground for the second time in history. And Moses was nowhere to be found. Joshua is in charge now. Because God ordained him. Baptized him. He called him from the dark. Set his feet up on a rock. Then Joshua went to Jericho, and God destroyed Jericho. Joshua went to Ai. There was some conflict there. You know why there was a problem there? Because one of the Israelites did not keep the words of the law on his lips, and he did things his own way. So the Israelites actually lost their second battle. They had to go back to Ai again after they repented of God, and guess what? Then they won that battle. God is not messing around. You've got to lean on Jesus, if you want to be successful in this life. It took the Israelites seven years and 13 battles. They lost one. They went 12 and one, but they still became national champions in the land of Canaan. It's an extraordinary story. And do you know why? Because they got it right and they kept God on their lips. They believed in him and his power and his glory. And they wouldn't back down because the snowball effect became something that they really got used to. They got used to leaning on God and they got used to seeing God win. And you can do the same in your life. In 1832, say 1832. Actually, this is so much fun. We're going to start with 1207. Uh, Miss Allie, you see that picture of that ugly man on the horse? There you go. Genghis Khan. He had a war cry. Matter of fact, he is the founder of the Mongols. Not the motorcycle gang out in California. He's the founder of the empire of the Mongols. The largest empire the world has ever seen from China, the Middle East, and even Russia. And he initiated a war cry called Ukai. And when they would go into battle, he would charge, and he and his military officers would charge, hollering out, UKI, UKI, UKI. They were good at one thing and one thing only, and that's killing. You can smile, it's okay. The Bible says there's a time and a place for everything. Sometimes it's time to kill. You'll see. Next. Ooh, war cries. The rebel yell. Any of you still got, I know there's rebels in here. As a matter of fact, there's a lot of rebels. Any of you still got a rebel yell left in you? The officers during the uh, 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 Civil War, they used to actually grade the the Confederate, who is it? The Confederate officers used to grade their officers on their rebel yell. Union officers said it was the absolute ugliest screech and scream you'd ever heard in their life, and they would shake in their boots. Next one. Geronimo! Any of you ever hollered Geronimo? It's a war cry from the 502nd Parachute Infantry in World War II. Next picture. Oh, this is a picture of Geronimo. We don't have time for that story. Maybe another time. Uh, Show me that picture of Curahi. It's that patch. There we go. The 506th. Parachute Infantry Regiment, was born in 1942, born and bred in Tocoa, Tocoa, Georgia, 1942. They used to climb up and down a hill, and all the way up the hill, they would holler out, three miles up, three miles down, three miles up, three miles down. And the name of that hill was Curahi. It's a Cherokee word for stands alone. And on D-Day, when they jumped out of their planes, They were hollering, Curahi, Curahi, stands alone. Next picture we want to show you. Mm 
Mm. The monument from the battle of San Jacinto. Just hang out right there, Miss Allie. 1832. Back up. Now let's back up. If you like history, you'll be cool with this. 1821. The Mexicans declared their independence over the Spanish. Spain lost control of the territory and it became a Mexican country, a Mexican territory. Now, some years later, in 1832, this one guy named President General Santa Ana. Some of you have heard of him. He became president in 1832. Now, up until 1832, Mexico was one of these democracy countries, sort of like the United States used to be. Oh, come on. Oh, now we're having fun. Now we are doggum having fun. In case you've forgotten, this is still we the people, wherever the camera's at, right here in America. This is we the people. The problem is Santa Ana decided he's going to trash we the people and he's going to set up a dictatorship, an evil kingship. And he abolished, listen to this carefully, he abolished all local governments. And he said, if you have a problem with that, come see me. Well, Texas happened to be a territory of Mexico at the time. Cool story, back in the day, the Mexicans actually were building a wall to keep the Americans out of Mexico. Super cool, super cool. It's just, the Bible says there's nothing new under the sun. <laughs> well, Texas was a Mexican territory, and they did not like Santa Ana's attitude. So they got together a militia and forced the Mexican military out of Texas. This upset Santa Ana's feelings, and he then marched to where else other than? That's what I like about y'all. San Antonio, Texas, the Alamo, where there were 200 soldiers waiting on Santa Ana's 1,500 soldiers, March 6, 1836. Santa Ana wasted no time. He surrounded the place for 13 days. February the 20-something, 23rd, and 13 days later on March 6th, Santa Ana all but destroyed the Alamo and killed all 200 soldiers. Left two women and a couple of their kids alive. That was it. Santa Ana left the Alamo, started sweeping across Texas. It's called the Runaway Scrape. A man by the name of Sam Houston and a militia of about 700 men were on the run. His men kept telling him, turn around, Sam. Turn around, Sam. Let's put it to these guys. And Sam kept saying, it's not time. It's not time. It's not time. It's not time. Matter of fact, some people in his regiment was calling him a coward, saying, we need to go fight. And Houston was saying, it's not time. It's not time. Santa Ana was sweeping through Texas, burning down towns, killing women, children, dogs, animals, goats, everything. He was collecting capturees. Then Santa Anta got to a place near southeast Texas. A place called Goliad. There was a fort there that a man by the name of James Fannin changed the name of. And he changed it to Fort Defiance because the Texans were defying Santa Anna. Santa Anna and his 1,500 men came up on 340 of Fannin's soldiers, surrounded them. Fannin and his soldiers out in an open field one day laid down their weapons and surrendered. Santa Anna put all of those soldiers, plus the capturees that he had, inside of Fort Defiance. Santa Anna then takes his 1,500 Soldiers and begins to continue to chase Sam Houston and those 700. Sam or Santa Anna sent word back to the commanding officer at Fort Defiance and he said, I want you to kill all 443 individuals inside Fort Defiance in cold blood. The biggest massacre. 
in Texas history. Santa Ana had those 443 people march out on a dirt road. They thought they were just going to another fort to be stationed. But the Mexican army lined up on both sides, got out their muskets and their guns, their billy clubs, and their knives. And they killed all 443 of those individuals in cold blood in Goliad, Texas. Santa Ana still chasing Sam Houston. Sam Houston backs up against this little place called San Jacinto. There was this river, still does, runs around Deer Park, Texas. Sam Houston gets himself lodged in that area, and he waits. His men still saying, we need to charge back against Santa Ana. Houston is saying, no, not yet, not yet, not yet. Finally, Santa Ana shows up, places his camp just 300 yards from Sam Houston's Texans. When Santa Ana came in behind Houston, Houston made a daring move. You see, what had happened was there was only one way in and one way out of this area where Santa Anta was now. He was surrounded by Sam Houston's army and the river behind him. And Sam Houston then went and he burned down the only escape route called Vince Bridge. And he burned that bridge down so that Santa Anna could not escape. Santa Anna had 800 He had 1,500 men versus Sam Houston's 700 men. Santa Anna was laughing his head off. But Sam Houston had a plan. And on April 1st, 1836, Houston told his men it was time. And Houston was running back and forth in front of his infantry and his cavalry. Just 700 men versus 1,500. And he says, men, in just a few minutes, we're going to race across this battlefield, and we're going to kill them all. And men in that, in that battalion, in that company, they were shaking in their boots, wondering how in the world this was going to happen, because the math didn't equate. It was 700 versus 15. How is this going to work? How is this going to work? And Sam Houston said, remember the Alamo. Remember Goliath. Sam Houston turns around, and he and he starts flying across the field on his horse. The infantry and the cavalry begin to follow him. Every single one of Houston's men were hollering out, remember the Alamo, remember Goliath. And in 18 minutes, that battle was over, and all of Santa Ana's men were dead, period. There is a time and a place for killing. When the enemy's got your back against the wall, you need to kill the enemy that's inside of you. You need to kill the thoughts when the enemy's lying to you. You need to kill them dead, dead, dead. Remember the cross of Jesus Christ. When you take your faith step forward, you remember the cross. You remember Jesus. You remember his blood shed on the cross. That was no cheap price to be paid for your freedom and your salvation. And when the enemy starts chirping in your ear and you're against the odds, you remember the cross in the name of Jesus. One of my favorite Musical lyrics in all of history comes from an old Kenny Rogers song. Coward of the county. At the end of the song, Tommy walks in the bar room and the Gatlin brothers thought this was going to be another easy one. And Tommy turned around to leave the bar room with the Gatlin brothers saying, oh, look, old yellow, leaving. But the Bible says, I mean, Kenny Rogers says, You could have heard a pin drop when Tommy stopped and locked the door. You know what? I wasn't there that day, but I'm sure Santa Ana, if he had not used the bathroom yet, he had to use it quickly when he saw that bridge burning because I'm sure you could have heard a pin drop when he saw that bridge burning thinking, what in the world is going on? In your life, let the odds get stacked against you. And then remember the cross. Remember Jesus Christ and his blood shed on that cross. Today we've taken communion. And it's right here and we're going to remember the cross today.
Allie, take us to Matthew chapter 26. There's a wafer on top of this little juice box. Careful now, this juice is 100% proof. It really is. The power of Jesus Christ is 100% proof. Jesus gathered his disciples together as a Passover dinner. They didn't recognize it as the Last Supper at that time. But at any rate, Jesus began to talk to them. And it began to sink into them like it began to sink into Joshua that day of what in the world is going on here. Jesus was charging his disciples. He was baptizing and he was anointing them that night. He was telling them that he's going to give his life and they're going to be in charge. But it's not going to be without help. It's going to be by the power of the Holy Spirit. He took that bread and he broke it. And you can break your wafer today as an illustration. And he said, every time you eat this, I want you to remember me. He hadn't died on a cross yet, but what he's saying is, I am going to die on a cross. And every time you get together after that, I want you to remember the cross. And I want you to fly across that battlefield, hollering out. Jesus, 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 Jesus. And you watch that enemy fade. Watch the enemy fade. Today can we eat remembering the name of Jesus. Remembering the cross. And then Jesus changed history. When he took the cup, he says, this is the cup of the new covenant. Every time you get together and you drink this wine, I want you to remember your freedom. Freedom. I think that was William Wallace who was calling out, freedom. Freedom. Friend, today when you drink this, it's imperative that you remember your freedom of salvation, freedom and healing, freedom of power, wisdom, strength, might, the ability to face your demons because you have angels and God Almighty and the Son of God, Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit, our helper, our baptizer, our counselor all at your side. So when you drink this wine, this cup, this juice here today, you remember your freedom in Jesus. Can we drink together? Would you all stand, please? Will my prayer team come down and just stand in between the altars? Today, he's uh, commissioning you with strength. He's baptizing you and anointing you with strength. These stories we talked about today, Joshua, Sam Houston, Jesus, they needed strength and God provided it. They needed to see a victory and God provided it. Today in your life, do you need strength? Do you need to see a victory? Is that you? And allow God to provide it. But you got to keep his word on your lips. You got to keep his thoughts in your mind. Quit paying attention to the media. And get your mind on Jesus. We're going to pray and we're specifically going to pray for Mr. Davey Watson today. He's standing in the gap because his wife is fighting for her life versus COVID. And we all know somebody by now that's got COVID either to an extreme or to a lesser amount. Today, I want you to stand in the gap for someone who is related to you, that you know, a friend of yours that has this nasty disease. That's this charge, this battle that we are against is coming from none other than the father of lies. 
And the only way we can combat that is to keep Jesus in front of us and the Holy Word of God on our lips and in our heart. Mr. Davey, would you lead the way and just come down to maybe Colonel Gray or Larry, who, whoever you like. And we want to pray for you today. Now I'm asking the rest of us, let's take a step this morning. Let's take a step in the right direction. I'm inviting every single person to come down here and stand in the presence of the Lord. Yes, there's the presence of the Lord all over the planet, but there's something about making a move forward and coming to get in the action. Some people aren't, they don't know why I like to go to rock and roll count concerts. I like to go to rock and roll concerts because the music is loud, the drums are beating, the electric guitar is on fire, the voices are screaming, and I can feel it in the innermost of my being, baby, and I love it. The same is true with worship, though. I love to come to the center of where God is doing stuff. I'm not one to stand in the back. Don't stand in the back today. It's okay. Come and join Davy. Come and stand in the gap for somebody that you know is fighting COVID. Come and stand in the gap for somebody that you know is losing their life. Come and stand in the gap for somebody that you know, spiritually speaking, needs to be picked up, needs to be healed in the name of Jesus. Don't stand back in the, in the back of the lines. Be one of those guys, be one of those girls that charges across the battlefield. First thing, hollering out, Jesus, 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 and watch that enemy fall today in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, come and allow God to finish what he started in your life today. Come and stand in the gap for a friend of yours in the name of Jesus.